It's good to see everybody out with us tonight, especially if you're visiting. Thank you so much for being here. Brother Matt in his songs tonight chose to lead us in songs, each one about Jesus. And the title of the sermon tonight is a direct quote from Jesus, one that Bible students will know very well from Luke chapter 2, about my father's business. As we start tonight, I want you to go ahead and open up your Bibles over there to Luke chapter 2. I tell you, one of the most frightening moments in the life of Mary and Joseph, I have to believe, is what we're going to find recorded in these verses that we're just about to read. We're going to start in Luke 2 and pick up in verse 41. This is what it says. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. This is Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus. And when he was twelve years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Let's go ahead and stop right there. Now, I want you to try to imagine, and parents will naturally just be in a better position to imagine this than non-parents, but I want you to imagine what it would be like to lose your child and the panic that would ensue. We are told that whenever these Jerusalem feasts occurred, and by that I mean when the Jews were required to go to the city, uh, whole towns would tend to travel together in a large caravan for many different reasons. They'd do it for protection. They'd do it for convenience. They'd travel as families and things of that nature. And so you can really see how Mary and Joseph would just assume that with all of these people, well, Jesus has got to be somewhere in this group. And how many other parents in that group would just assume their children were there? And then they couldn't find Jesus. Can you imagine? You imagine the panic. The, the, I think the worst that we ever had, Jackie and I, uh, was a few years ago. We were at Myrtle Beach. We went to this outdoor mall with all the family there, a place called Barefoot Landing. And we're walking through. And we lost one of the kids, and I will just let you guess which one it was. We lost one of the kids. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was him. That's right. We lost one of the kids, and we were, it was, it was jam-packed. And we're looking all over the place, and it was one of those nights, a, a huge storm was coming in off the ocean. We're watching it get closer and closer, and we can't find Jacob for anything. And we looked and we looked and we finally actually heard him wailing. And that's how, that's how we found him. But there's that panic. And that was only for 10 or 15 minutes. But there's that panic that sets in. And I think every parent feels that to some extent. Well, they've been looking for Jesus for three days. Three days. Besides the fact that this is your child, this isn't just a child. <laughs> Remember how he entered the world. Remember what Mary was told. They've just lost the Messiah. What an incredible thing that must have been. And so they've been searching for Jesus and they find him. Picking up there in verse 48. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Can't you see the relief mixed with anger there? And you can almost get the the, the picture of Mary embracing Him one second, putting Him at arm's length the next, embracing Him, putting Him at arm's length, and just, why did you do this? We're so glad we... But why did you do this? And you just get that idea. And then Jesus makes the statement there. And He said to them, Why were you looking for Me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house, some translations say, about my father's business. I think that's a profound statement, especially considering that it's coming from 12-year-old Jesus. And Mary didn't understand what he was saying to them. 
I think anybody understood what he was saying to them at that time. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But what I want us to focus on in the sermon this evening is the reminders. I think there are some essential reminders that our 12-year-old Savior provides for you and I that ought to guide us in our lives today. And I want to start with this. Jesus knew that he was God's son. Did you not know I must be about my father's business or in my father's house? He wasn't talking about Joseph. And what he's saying here was certainly not designed to hurt Joseph's feelings or to take a shot in some way at Joseph. This was a recognition of who his father really was. And Jesus knew that, was aware of it. And the thing is, beloved, we've got to be aware of that as well. God is our Father, for those of us who are Christians, in a very unique sense. And we have got to live with a constant awareness of the fact. In the singing service that we had Friday evening, Brother John was mentioning one of the songs that he loves so much. One of the lines in that song is a constant sense of thy abiding presence. And it's talking about God there. A constant sense of his abiding presence. A constant sense of he as our father. That's what Jesus understood. That's what he recognized. And based upon what Jesus did... He can be our Father as well. And we need to live with that awareness. I want you to consider some verses with me. In John 20 and verse 7, now this is after the resurrection. Mary's clinging to Him. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to Me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to My brothers and say to them, I am ascending to My Father and your Father. To my God and your God. Jesus did what he did so that he could make that statement. He's no longer just my father. He is your father in that very personal, very unique sense. One of the the, the, the astounding passages in all of Scripture is Hebrews 2 and verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Now maybe somebody might look at that passage in John 20 and 17. Okay, well, that's obviously speaking of God in a very unique, very intimate sense. But that's just got to be for the apostles, right? And we're certainly not the apostles today. So so can we have this same sort of relationship? Hebrews 2 and verse 11 is about those who are being sanctified. Do you know who that is? That's every child of God sitting in this auditorium right now. We are all in the process of becoming more holy, right? The song that we're going to be singing after the sermon is More Holiness Give Me. We talked about this when we, uh, when we went through the, the short series on Take Time to Be Holy. A good way to define sanctification is the process of making us more holy, more like Christ. That verse is about us. And it's saying Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Well, if He is calling us brothers and sisters, what does that mean about His Father? It means He's our Father too, doesn't it? One of the great passages on this topic is found over in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16, which says this, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The idea there is, dear Father. We can cry that out to our God. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 
God is striving to get it across to us, to get us to understand He is our Father now in a very unique, very intimate sense. And He is that because of what our Lord accomplished. Opening up the way to the most holy place through His body. You look at the book of Hebrews, as wonderful as that book is, all the different things that that book talks about, I think there is one overriding theme to that book, and it is this. We have access to God. And we have access to God because of Jesus Christ. That's what that book is about. You look at a passage there like Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11, it's thrilling, isn't it? It really is. It's thrilling. He is not ashamed to call us brothers. And if we are a brother to Jesus Christ, we are children of the Father. What an awesome thought that is. Praise God for it. Praise Him for it every single day. And we all understand this, that children have obligations to their parents, right? You read in the old law, you read in the new law, children have responsibilities to their parents. Of course, there's the obedience that is involved. There's the honor and the respect that is involved as parents grow older and, and sometimes are in, in no condition to take care of themselves anymore. Well, children need to make a return. Their children need to step in and do what they can to, to support and help their parents. But if we have an obligation to our fleshly parents, and we love them dearly, and we should, how much more of an obligation do we have to our Heavenly Father. Turn your Bibles with me, if you will, over to Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. We're going to note something that Jesus says here. So a lot of things that we can say about our Lord. One of them is this. He certainly never lost the awareness of who His true Father was. In Matthew 12, beginning in 46, still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Verse 48. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And Jesus is showing us that's how we have to think. Beloved, it really is. I am fortunate and, 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 and I strive to recognize this as the blessing that it is to have good Christian parents. My physical mom and dad. Good, solid Christians. But I want you to, to know this, and it's true for you just as it is for me. I have a lot of mothers. <laughs> and I have a lot of brothers. And I have a lot of sisters. And I have a lot of grandmothers, and I have a lot of grandfathers. A lot of them are sitting out here right now. See, that's what it means to have God as our family, or as our Father. It means that Anywhere we go, beloved, anywhere we go, on the face of this earth, if there is a faithful brother or sister in that area, we have family there. We have family there. We don't have to have ever met them before. We don't have to be in, in constant communication with them. Because we know this, we have the most important thing in common. We share a father. And we share a brother. And that's an extraordinary thing. Beloved, we must have a constant sense, a constant awareness of that. And because Jesus did have that constant awareness, knowing that He was God's Son, the entirety of His life, even those, those, those things that would appear just the common daily activities, the mundane activities of life, things that are done not under a microscope, when there aren't a great many people to, to stand there and observe what we're doing, just the most common mundane tasks of His life, Jesus performed them within the context of His love for His Father and His obedience to His Father's will. Right there in Luke 2, as you go on, verses 51 and 52, and He went down with them, 
and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now there's another verse. I want to just look at the very first part of it that comes during the ministry of our Lord. And he asked this question to some who were standing there uh, opposing him. Which one of you convicts me of Now here's what I think is the significance of that question and the answer to it. Those individuals to whom he asked that question, they could have observed Jesus through every minute of every day, and they would never be able to point out a single sin. Not one. Not one. That means those times when Jesus was just in what we would call the living room of His house with Mary. Not one time did Jesus respond to her in a disrespectful, sinful way. That means when Jesus was over at the shop, the the carpentry shop there doing some work, not one time did He treat anybody with anything less than absolute integrity as they were setting forth a price for the labor that Jesus was going to do. Not one time was He anything less than absolutely honest. As Jesus dealt with His brothers and as He dealt with other people throughout uh, His life as He was growing up, not one time did He commit a sin against them. Not once when it was a one-on-one situation where nobody else was around to see it, but Jesus and that individual. Not one time did He sin. How is it that you can do that? How is it that one can go through even the most mundane, common activities of life and never sin? I think there's just one way. Recognizing that every single moment, whether we're around a great many people, whether we're all alone sitting in our living room or in our bedroom at home and nobody is seeing us, every single moment must be lived within the context of our love for our Father. Every one of them. And our absolute determination to obey His will. I want you to consider some things that the Apostle Paul says over in Colossians chapter 3. Verse 17, then verses 23 and 24. He says, And whatever you do, In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. These verses are saying every single thing that we do, everything we put our hands on, every action that we take, every thought that we, we, we allow to become more than just a passing thought, Everything that we do, we are to do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means by His authority and in a way that honors Him. And there is no exception to that. And so, beloved, we have to understand that when we leave here tomorrow morning, You go out to your workplace, you go to wherever it is you're going to go. We're just going about those mundane, common activities of life, and you're not there to observe me, and I'm not there to observe you. Nothing at all changes from this moment in the sense that we are still children of God. We are still children of God. We are still being observed, and everything we do must be done to His glory. There are those who have really kind of downplayed this, this sort of thought that brethren have, have said in the past. And this is usually within the context of some say all of life is worship. Often those individuals are doing that in an effort to say we don't have to come to an assembly. I can worship just as well on the couch as I can at home. Fine, but I mean, you're, you're clearly violating open commands that, that say we should assemble. 
But beloved, in a reaction against that, let's not think for a moment that we do not honor God in the things that we do on a daily basis. Some have said, you mean to tell me I can glorify God when I go out and cut the grass? You better believe you can glorify God when you go out there and do it. You can do it with the things that you're thinking about. The things that you're meditating on. The things that you're focused on. I don't know about you, but grass cutting time for me is a thinking time. I come up with a lot of sermons and a lot of articles when I'm cutting the grass. That's a thinking time. You mean I can glorify God when I'm doing the dishes? You better believe you can glorify God, just in what you're thinking about, what you're allowing to dwell in your mind and in your heart. Yes, you can do that. And I would go beyond that to say you'd better be doing that because those are the mundane, common things in life. Part of the everything that you do, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody says, well, that makes it sound like we have to be thinking about these spiritual things all the time. Ah, <laughs> there it is, right? That's what we're trying to get. That's the goal. We're thinking about these spiritual matters, doing things in a way that would glorify and magnify God all the time. Maybe somebody else says that seems like an oppressive way to live, but I'll tell you this. There is nothing more wonderful than knowing that what you're doing at the moment, you are doing in a way that honors the Father. Absolutely nothing. And that's what we're striving to get, every single one of us. That's what we're aiming for. Whatever you do, whenever you do it, and wherever you do it, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, by His authority, and to glorify the Father. But as we mentioned, Mary didn't understand this. She didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And that reminds us that Jesus was and is, even today, very often misunderstood or just there's absolutely no understanding with what he has said or what he is seeking to get across. And this misunderstanding, it can come for a variety of reasons. And I think we can see several of these reasons in the Scripture. We're going to look at just three of them. Number one is just open prejudice and, and hostility. In John chapter 8, Jesus was speaking to some who were opposing him. And he asked the question, Why do you not understand what I say? And then he gives the answer. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Why could those particular individuals at that time not understand what Jesus was saying? And because they had put themselves firmly in the hands of the adversary. And we're buying into his lies. That's one reason, and it's a reason that continues even up to today. Prejudice and hostility towards the Lord and towards his message. There's another reason you can think about, just years of ingrained error. Over in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews... Folly to Gentiles. Now, I want us to focus on the Jewish aspect of that. You can think about even the Lord's apostles. It's interesting. Of the many times you see it said, but they did not understand what He was saying, it's interesting to note how many of those come right after He told them about His death. That wasn't the Jewish expectation. That is not what they were looking towards. And even though Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and, and there are many other passages in the Old Law, point to the suffering Messiah for whatever reason, they were not grasping that. And they were thinking of a physical Messiah who would be a physical king, a great mighty leader who would throw off Roman oppression, and that is not at all what Jesus was going to be. And so when he came, even those who were not hostile to him and were not hostile to the message, well, they were dealing with years of ingrained error 
And it was very difficult for them to understand the Lord. And then a third reason is just more growth. More maturity is required. As Jesus was coming towards the end of his time with his apostles, the public ministry had ended by this point, And he was trying to prepare them for these final hours for what was just about to come. He says in John 16 and verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't. You have things in Scripture, passages, you've looked at for many, many years, you still wrestle with them. You just don't feel like you can understand it yet. You just haven't gotten to it. You haven't gotten to that point where you really get it. You really grasp it. Let me ask you this. Did you have passages like that in the past and now you look at them and you do understand? You do get it? You do grasp it? See, I would suggest we've all been in places where the Lord could say this very same thing to us. Look, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Oh, they're all still in there. They're all still in Scripture. It's just we're not yet in a place where we can comprehend it. We haven't grown to that point. There needs to be more Bible knowledge. There needs to be more maturity. There needs to be more spiritual growth. People misunderstand the Lord then and now for these reasons and perhaps even for some others. As we said, even Mary didn't understand this. But what did she do? She treasured these things up in her heart. She treasured them until eventually she did understand. And even if it wasn't until after our Lord's crucifixion and His resurrection that she did understand, she got there because she had treasured those things. Well, here's the thing, beloved. You and I must do the very same thing. And I want to say something to you now that isn't reinventing the wheel, isn't saying anything profound. It's just the way it is, the way it's always been, and the way it's going to be. If we would grow, if we would mature, if we would continue to gain uh, a greater understanding of Scripture, there is absolutely no substitute to study. There is no substitute to prayer, and there is no substitute to meditation upon what we've read. There is no other way you and I will grow. Absolutely none. We can fill our bookshelves with religious books and read a chapter here or there every now and then. We can do that if we want to do it. We can peruse websites and look at articles that are online, and sometimes we might even take value from that. He might even change some of the radio stations we listen to and put some acapella music on there, listen to worship songs, all good things. If we're going to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of our God, we're going to do it through study. We're going to do it through thought. We're going to do it through prayer. And we're going to do it in no other way. Cherishing these words in our heart doesn't mean that Mary just thought, that's an interesting thing, I'll just file that away and might come back to it from time to time. If you cherish something, you're holding it, aren't you? It's dear to you. You're spending time on it. You're thinking about it. You're thinking about it deeply. Brethren and friends, that's what we're trying to do with this. That's what we're called upon to do. Cherish this. We talked this morning about precisely what it is we're holding in our hands. In the very revelation of the God who said, Be all that we see was. That's what we hold here. The revelation of the one who loved us even before he created us, who loved us despite knowing we were going to be as wicked as we could be and need someone to step in to save us because we'd make a mess of the whole thing, which is what we did. We hold the revelation of that God in our hands. Cherish this, beloved. Cherish this. This is the power of God unto salvation. And if we would have that power just fill our lives 
It's got to fill our hearts. The only way it's going to get there is through study, meditation, and prayer, which is the way it's gotten there for every child of God who has ever been. And so we look at 12-year-old Jesus. He knew precisely what he was about, didn't he? He knew precisely what he was about. Brethren, let's learn from his understanding. Let's learn from his commitment to his and our Father. And if we do, we become even more like our Lord and Savior. And there is no greater, no greater goal that we can achieve in this life. There may be some here tonight who are not Christians, and if that's the case, you have the opportunity now to render your obedience to Christ. To become just like Him in the sense that our Father, His Father rather, can become yours in a very unique and intimate way. It all starts with believing that Jesus is who He claimed to be. I hope that you do believe that, but if you do, understand you've taken just a first step, a necessary one, but a first one. Let that belief become Bible faith, and Bible faith requires obedience. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Jesus as Lord, and be immersed in water, coming in contact with that cleansing blood, putting Him on there in the waters of baptism and rising out of that water in newness of life and on the road that leads to heaven. If you're subject to the call of the gospel, please come forward now as together we stand and sing. Whoa.